like to heartily apologize for what just happened. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm real sorry. I believe that you had expressed to me that this could potentially salvage our season and end on a high note. In my defense, I did use the word potentially, and I was wrong in a truly devastating and horrible way. I recognize that ignorance is not a legally protected defense. And also I should have known better because this was made in 1985 for whatever. And uh, we were not any better in the 80s than we were in the 60s. So mea culpa. And I humbly beg forgiveness. Welcome to the Cinderella podcast where we watch and review every Cinderella adaptation we can get our hands on, watching the same story over and over until we slowly go insane. I'm Liv. And I'm Talon. And today we watched Ye Shen, made in 1984, the animated Chinese Cinderella, Cinderella. Folks, it's another one of those white people decide to portray a culture and do it really badly with racist caricatures real bad Yay! <laughs> yeah this one had a runtime of 24 minutes and i was hopeful that we could get through this in a single watch normally if something is shorter than 15 minutes there we have to rewatch it there's just no way but i was hopeful that i would not have to watch this twice but after about mm, 30 seconds i think my notes just said i hate this 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 and then I stopped taking notes. So I had to watch it again. It was notably not better the second time around. I agree with that evaluation. So what we're talking about today is a half hour animated feature uh, made for CBS Story Break. And they just did these animated adaptations of children's books that were published like around the time that they were doing this. And this was the 80s, and so they had this really intense intro with guitars. So this is based on a picture book made by Ailing Louie. I looked up the picture book. The picture book is beautiful. The illustrations are these beautiful watercolor, like flowing, gorgeous things. The writing looked good. I looked at the couple of pages that are available on Amazon. All the things that are wrong with this cartoon are not coming from the book. No, the story itself, and we had a, a conversation about how to discuss this because, again, the entire thing is just, it's just soaked in a horrifically racist uh, Western view of Asian culture. And it will be the entire time. So we would like to address that, but we can't focus on it because every single scene will be this is another horribly racist scene and that's not fun to listen to for anybody so just understand just know that, that it's there it's there i got a lot of contempt from this like there is a serious undercurrent of just oh yeah this was not a labor of love essentially with character design the more attractive and good and nice and kind and whatever a character is the more they look like traditionally Western beauty and then uh, the the kinder and better a character is the physically whiter their skin is. Um, Yeshen's skin is pure white almost all the time. Occasionally she has a hint of color and the more poor or unpleasant a person is the more just straight up yellow they color their skin and it's bad and um in an attempt to do, I think, something resembling traditional Chinese hairstyles and dress and just general day-to-day -day wear. We get 1940s cartoons from World War. We get 1940s propaganda cartoons is what we get, essentially. The way they chose to do the voice acting for this is also on a scale from no accent at all to caricature of a Chinese accent. Yeah. All right, so I think we have to actually start talking about this now. 
Do you know the show won an Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program? Not this specific one, though, right? Not the specific instant. Thank God. But, like, the oh. year this came out on the show. Yeah. I just thought you should know that. Thanks. Thanks for that information, Talon. Okay, so it starts with this guy, the host, Bob Keeshan. And this is a real, like, human man mm -hmm. in a very cartoony set. And yes. he holds up the picture book and starts talking about Cinderella and how this is a different version uh, based on a picture book by Ailing Louie. And this is like a version that she heard from her grandmother. And that it is at least a thousand years older than the one that we're used to. And then he ends with, you'll find the differences surprising. And then it's an animated cartoon. Yes. And uh, we open on essentially the opening of Mulan. It's just uh, nice music and uh, lovely backgrounds. I will say that the outdoor backgrounds in this were lovely. The foregrounds, not so much, but the backgrounds were well drawn. They were pretty. So we see our Cinderella, Yeshen, carrying buckets with a, I bet you know what it's called. It's a yoke. So a yoke, thank it's, you. It's a bamboo stick uh, with two buckets at the end and she has this over her shoulders and we're watching the village and so lots of people are walking by carrying this and she's wearing sort of the traditional day dress which is a, a high collar button down shirt th that goes to the mid thigh and loose trousers essentially there's this random guy who's like yeah. into her and goes "Ooh, now that one has a pretty face and the man standing next to him, who's referred to within the context of this, only as the handsomest one. So I will also be calling him the handsomest one. I have him down as the prince in my notes because I read the synopsis and he's in the synopsis as prince. He has a white peacock feather in his hat, which is how we'll keep track of him. So he says, I'm looking for a beautiful wife, not a pretty servant. And the random guy kind of persists and goes over to Yashen and asks if she need help, needs help carrying her burden. And she goes, no, thank you. I'm quite strong. And then he asks if she's going to the festival. And she says, perhaps. And then he goes, well, then I'll see you there. And she goes, perhaps. The handsomest one announces, I look forward to the festival. All the beauties will be there. And I will pick the prettiest one to be my wife. You are so much better at writing script down than I am. I just, I applaud you and your diligence. So we pan up to a cave in a mountainside, which is where our home will be set. The stepmother and stepsister are there and they are furious because they believe that Yeshen was flirting with these people. I guess we got to describe them. So the stepsister is, again, tall and pointy. There's just the one this time, blessedly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she's just sort of the tall, pointy, wiggly stepsister caricature. She has hair that is up in sort of a traditional high style, but also has random squiggly bits just sticking out of it. And she has a very grating voice. The mother is bald to the the middle of her head and has loops of hair that are straightened and then curled back in on themselves and she's I don't know maybe maybe 82 percent eyebrows <laughs> just entirely eyebrows and very very either pink or purple lips that are always contorted into very extreme shapes and their faces are very overdrawn compared to the amount of lines used on Ye Shen's face versus yes. their faces. So in animation, the more lines you put on something, the more grotesque it starts to look. Just and that is, fleshy. That is successful. That is uh, accomplished. The stepmother says, what did I do to deserve a stepdaughter like that? And the stepsister responds with mother you can't let her go to the festival i can't handle that kind of competition and then she runs off crying into the cave which is my favorite note i've ever written so my note here is i would like to know that at this point 
there is a single ladder up to a hanging bridge that goes to the cave. So that's yes. that's where that's where we are. Yeshan is carrying two heavy buckets of water balanced on a bamboo stick over her shoulder while climbing a ladder up a mountain to a cave. Welcome to the Cinderella, y'all. So she gets up there and her stepmother greets her with, Yeshen, you worthless orphan. So we've just established the tone for the whole movie. Yeah, that pretty much covers it. If nothing else, this is yeah. this is the crux. Yep. So Yeshen, as Talon previously mentioned, is very lightly drawn, very few lines on her face. She's very delicate. She's pale. She has thick, dark hair with a blue streak. She also has a lot of flowers in her hair, and it's very pretty. It's very pretty. Her hair is uh, sort of loose and lightly bound. Her hair goes to about the mid-shoulder length. And she has delicate features, I suppose. Everybody's eyes are a really upsetting amount of slanted in this. So the stepmother berates her for shamelessly flirting. And what a sorry day it was when she took her in. And the stepsister says that she should be punished. And the stepmother goes, good idea, my dear, sweet, unmarried daughter. And every time she refers to her daughter, she calls her unmarried daughter with like a different adjective. And I did actually enjoy that running gag. Me too. That was fun. Uh, Yeshen also has the most bizarre bangs I've ever seen in my life. It's basically a forelock like a horse would have. It's a little tiny black bang situation, but only sort of directly above her nose. It's bizarre. It's a bizarre bang situation given the rest of her hair and everybody else's hairstyles. When you consider that this was made in the 80s, a lot of things make sense. I don't think the 80s had bangs like horses for locks. I think they had bangs that covered their entire forehead, you know, from one side to the other. I mean, I wasn't there, but <laughs> I am fairly confident. I don't recall seeing pictures of people with half bangs. We have to get through this scene. Oh, I don't want to. So the stepmother says that since Yeshen was too busy to work, uh, here's all the breakfast you deserve. And she gives her a handful of rice and tells her to go do the washing. And that's when we meet our fairy godmother? Question yep. mark? <laughs> question mark, question mark. Yep, this is our fairy godmother. Uh, our fairy godmother is called Gold Eyes. He's a fish. Is a fish, yep. Uh, a fish who is voiced by... Uh, an adult movie actor. The voice is low and disturbing and doesn't match anything else in this movie. And I hated every second that he spoke. I did not pick up on that. I was fine with that. What I was blown away by was when I looked the story itself up online, Wikipedia told me that the fish is described as being roughly 10 feet. Which miss, miss that detail. Which the cartoon did not draw the fish as being roughly 10 feet, but I imagined him as being 10 feet. <laughs> and that made this experience better. So uh, Gold Eyes is a magic talking fish. He's about the size of a large carp. Also gold. Uh, we said gold eyes, but he also has gold, gold everything else. And he, she, she throws a little bit of rice into the water and he swims up to a rock and then climbs out of the water leaving basically just his tail in and props his four fins on the rock and begins to talk to her sort of like a seal but it is fish and I didn't like it. I was fine with that. I was very moved by the fact that Yeshen was like I saved some rice for you and the fish was like, have you had your share? And she said, yes, but I don't think she did because there was only a handful to begin with and she gave a handful to Gold Eyes. Yeah, the Gold Eyes Yeshen friendship is very sweet. So they talk about how they're so lucky to have a friend like each other. And Yeshen says that he's her only friend. And she kind of like nuzzles him on the forehead and smooches him. Which is, again, adorable, but super gross. Um, this is a giant fish. This is a giant fish. Fish are uh, 
I'm a little bit afraid of fish, so I'm probably not a fair judge, but fish are gross. So Goldeye says, at the festival, you'll meet a special friend. And so she, she announces that she dreams of going to the festival and spins around in a very jerky fashion. The animation in this in general is not smooth. I would describe it as less than smooth. It is for a TV show, so I'm trying not to be too judgy about that. If this was like a feature film, I'd yeah. be more angry. Yeah, but but it also it was not good. Yeah, no. So we for, we offer it some forgiveness, but it wasn't good. She says she dreams of dancing and meeting someone who'll love her. To which Goldeyes responds, and someone who'll take you away from that wretched stepmother. And there's this weird pause, and Yeshen goes, "Yes, that too," with like a finger guns hand gesture i hated every time this movie did this did what existed had frames i mean yes but it would occasionally just lodge or jab a very modern turn of phrase yeah into the into the fairy tale and it was just always so jarring and just it had Shrek vibes. I didn't like it. It didn't work. So um, Gold Eyes then, I've got vertically back pedals through the water. I don't have a better way of describing this. He's mostly out of the water, vertically, and he's moving backwards. So draw your own conclusions. And he's saying that she deserves a better life and he promises he'll give her one. And he does a big fancy jump. And then he swims back to her to help her with the wash. Do you have any notes about the way that she is doing the wash? Because I do. Oh, okay. I don't have any notes about how she's doing the wash. I just have notes about the fact that Goldeye is helping by just smacking the water with his fishtail mm-hmm. and just splashing water at where she's trying to knead the clothes. She's kneading them into grass, which is growing on dirt. Which is definitionally dirty and not clean. And when you get it wet, it turns into mud. So what she's doing is rolling clothes in mud and being splashed by a giant talking unicycling koi. And it just goes downhill from there. So the stepsister sees them from the bushes and she runs back to her mother and she goes, mother, 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 I must tell you something. And then she falls down at the last moment at the little bridge. (laughs) And the stepmother goes, tell me what, my clumsy unmarried daughter. That was fun. (laughs) I did Um, like that moment. Yes. So she tells her that Yishen has a talking fish. And the stepmother (laughs) goes, my poor daughter, how will you ever get a husband if you believe in talking fish? Which was a great moment. I, there are a number of times where just there's a talking fish gets announced in this movie. And everyone who's told there's a talking fish responds very reasonably with, oh, oh, you're crazy. (laughs) And I liked that. I did like that. So they decide that they're going to go see for themselves. And Yeshan and Golda are still doing the washing. So they're caught in the act twice. Yes. We then get this scene. The stepmother and stepsister are both peeking out through the bushes. So the stepmother goes, do we need to talk to a fish? And stepsister goes, Yes. And stepmother goes, no, what will it do? Tell us that the water is wet. Do we need a fish to do our wash? And the stepsister goes, yes. And the stepmother goes, no, Yeshen does our wash. Do we need a fish to provide food? And the stepsister goes, no. And the stepmother goes, yes. And we cut to Yeshen saying bye-bye, literally bye-bye to the fish and walks away. And he says that he will wait for her return. And he backflips away. Yeshen picks up the washing and puts the basket on her head and begins to walk home. She is accosted by the stepmother and the stepsister. They mock her for having an animal sidekick by asking if she perhaps needs an owl to help her hang the wash to dry. Yep. Which was a bizarre joke that I really enjoyed. And then the stepmother gives her just an arbitrarily difficult task, which is another thing I really like in the Cinderella story. She mm-hmm. wants Yeshen to gather wood from the far side of the forest because wood from the far side of the forest burns longer. And this will take all day. 
She also demands that Yishan take off her red coat, saying that it's filthy, and she basically rips it off of her, even though the whole time Yishan is saying that it's completely clean, and it's mm-hmm. obviously clean. Yep. So obviously, this is all a scam. Yishan runs off into the forest for the firewood. Meanwhile, the stepmother throws the cloak over her shoulders and kind of backs her way up to the pond, kind of hopping. With sneaky music. Whilst- Quadding. The, the music in the background of this is like it's great <laughs> so we know that something you want to be very clear something not on the level is about to happen and she tosses some rice like over her shoulder into the pond and of course gold eyes comes up and he's He's like, hello, and she takes the red cloak and she tosses it over him and she captures gold eyes. And she says, since you can talk, perhaps you can tell me the best way to cook you. And we get a horrifying moment that I had missed the first time I had to watch this nonsense, miserable show, where there's a really brief frame of the fish's face looking up from the cloak in this just horrified, still wide eyes open fish mouth gaze and i i knew this was going to happen because i read the synopsis yeah i'm so sorry everyone i guess this is kind of a late in the game warning the fish gets eaten yeah the fish is killed and eaten bad things happen to the fish yep but it it turns out that this was the fish's destiny so like don't be too sad but Mm. But yeah, it's really sad. So we cut to nighttime and Yeshen is climbing the ladder home again with the firewood. She's coming in and the stepmother tells her to stack the firewood. And the stepmother and stepsister are sitting at the dinner table facing her and it's got a long blue tablecloth on it. And the stepmother goes, you missed the best dinner we ever had. It was a fish dinner. You should have been the one to cook it. And Yeshen goes, you bought a fish? She still doesn't know. And stepmother goes, I caught a fish in the pond, a fat fish with golden eyes. And it kept calling your name. Yeah, Shen, yeah, Shen. Tell them to use more soy sauce. And then they cackle. And yeah, Shen is an appropriate level of absolutely horrified. But good news, they continue with, we saved the best part for you. And they pull off a napkin from one of the plates And it's full of fish bones because this movie hates you and wants you to suffer. Yeshen gasps in horror, covers her face with her hands and runs in tears from the room as they continue to cackle. And she runs to the pond, calling for him, hoping that this is a lie. But he does not come because he got killed and eaten. And we just see her tears falling in the pond and leaving little ripples. And I hated it. And I was prepared for this. I was, I knew this was going to come. I had emotionally steeled myself to not become emotionally attached to a giant, weird, unicycling, golden koi. I failed. I somehow really cared about Gold Eyes and his dumb, terrible name. And he always looks so happy to see her. I don't know. He He kind of hit me hard. He gave off very Labrador vibes. And it was just really hard. I did not care about him. I cared about Yeshen's attachment to him, which was kind of a different thing. So the stepsister and stepbrother are snoring and Yeshen is laying on, it's not really a bed. It's like a cot on the floor. Yeah. Like a mattress. It's a, it's a thin pallet. Yeah. And she's got the plate with the bones in front of her and she's talking to it. And she says, I'm sorry for what happened to you. It was all my fault. And then the bones start to glow and the golden outline of the fish like appears. Over them, appears over them. It's like a firefly, like a firefly, but it's a fish. Yeah, and it goes, it wasn't your fault. It was my fate. Yeshen responds very appropriately. Who said that? (laughs) And then the flashing golden fish ghost says, it's me, gold eyes. I'm just bones now, but magical bones. You've been such a good friend. I want to return your kindness. I must, or I cannot journey to the pond of my forefathers. I, oh, I, so that's a new motivation. That's very original for me. 
Yeah, wasn't anticipating that. It also does put a bit of a crimp on the I'm doing this because I love you or because you're worthy story puts a weird spin on that. So he makes her a big meal of food. Big yes. food, yummy meal. And she says, there's so much food. Should I share it with them? Meaning her stepmother and stepsister. To which the fish responds, did they share me with you? Like, no, but also, what? Why would you think that that's... I don't think she's ready for that, man. Like, it's too early to joke about that. I don't think he was joking. I think he was serious. I think he's mad that she didn't get her fair share of eating the flesh of her best animal. I hate it. It's so gross. So the next day, she's, she's in a field gardening, and her stepmother and stepsister are berating her for not doing it thoroughly enough. And he feeds her again, and he keeps pressing her to ask him for more things. This pattern continues. The next day, she's washing clothes again. And this time, the stepmother and stepsister are with her in the pond, just sort of waiting. And the stepmother asks if she's fattening up another fish. So she's welcome to die at any time. I'd be fine with that. The stepsister says, oh, my feet are so muddy, and deliberately walks her extremely muddy feet over the clean clothes, just wiping them, and then picks up the now muddy clothes and goes, don't you know how to wash this stupid girl? And once again, Yeshen gets punished with no supper. Yes. So her fish friend is telling her that it's not fair for them to treat her this way. And Yeshan says, I know, but I was an orphan. They gave me a home. Goldeye says, you give them more than they give you. Let me do things for you. Just ask for the laundry to be done. And it'll happen. Like whatever chores you have, I will do them. Mm -hmm. They will be done. And she says, I don't mind doing those things for now because I hope to find my true love at the festival. And Goldeye says, oh, if that's your destiny. Okay. What? There's so many wild things in there. There's so many things in there. If that's your destiny, I just... All right, so, so we cut to the next day, I suppose, the future at some point. The stepsister is up on a low stool ha having a gown fitting, essentially. And her gown is fancy. It has long bell-like sleeves. It's white. It has pale pink edging with pink, very pointy shoulder pieces and a long blue front hanging insert piece. And her hair is up and very elaborate. And the stepmother is saying, gorgeous, gorgeous. You'll be the most beautiful unmarried girl at the festival. And the stepsister responds, will I really? And the stepmother goes, provided there are no other, there are no other girls at the festival. <laughs> the ribbing between the stepmother and stepsister was the only thing that held me to sanity in this movie. That was it. I didn't love it. <laughs> no, it wasn't good, but it, it held me to sanity. So I, I'll take it. So the stepsister turns to Yeshen now, who is hemming her robes and says, Yeshen, do you think I'll find a husband? Yeshan is a weirdo and a creep and goes completely sincerely as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Yes, there'll be music and dancing and the young men will be looking carefully at the young women selecting brides. And one of the men, perhaps the handsomest one, will ask you to be his bride and I'll be with you to help you at all I can. Yep, that's, that's the line. That's what she says in utter sincerity. I understand like kindness being a virtue, et cetera, et cetera. But this is like past that. This is all the way into Stockholm syndrome. Th this is this is bizarre. This is um, full on captor bonding. Yep. Yeah. The stepmother basically says, Did anyone say you could go to the festival? And Yeshen goes, Well, you said I could go. It's the only thing I've been looking forward to. The stepmother says, I say that every year that you can go, and you can go. Maybe next year, or the year after that, or the year after that. Isn't that good of me? And the stepsister goes, it's very good of you, mother. And they cackle. And Yeshen runs away, crying. Again. again. Uh, now it's the night of the festival, and the stepmother is yelling at Yeshen not to leave the cave. Or she'll get the beating of her life. Yep. And then she tells her daughter... 
let me hear positive thinking. And the stepsister starts chanting, I will find a husband. I will be a bride. I will find a husband. I will be a bride. As they climb down the ladder from their cave. Okay, this is what I wanted to talk about. And this is why I mentioned the cave being one ladder up. They climb down approximately 150 ladders. Oh. They, they climb down ladders, just endless ladders. And it was really confusing for me. I don't know why that particular detail bothered me, but I was upset about it. So Yeshen goes to her magic pile of fish bones and tells them that she cannot go to the festival. And the fish responds, she must go, and says that he'll take her. And he turns into fancy golden platform shoes with curly toes. To which Yeshen goes, where are you? <laughs> and an orange puff of smoke comes out of the shoes. And she is transformed into, her, her rags are transformed into a beautiful gown. She's wearing a sort of triangular headdress with curving tips. It's uh, another white gown with extremely long tailing sleeves. It's got sort of a golden amoeba shaped front piece. I really wanted it to be shaped sort of like a fish, but it's not. It's just shaped like an amoeba. She's got blue pointy shoulder accents and her hair is uh, loose now, but it is now past her butt in terms of length. If the bones of your dead magic fish friend can't give you longer hair then yeah. i don't know what we're doing here that that's fine it just it always in cinderella transformations it always bugs me when she changes physically like, oh yeah i don't i don't like that i don't like it when her hair is different i don't like it when she physically changes into another human being altogether uh the whole point of the magic of the fairy godmother is that it gives her essentially the classist entry the ticket to enter a place where she would be prohibited from going where she can be seen and loved for her beauty and her goodness that she just didn't have access to get to before mm -hmm. so i don't like it when they physically change her kind of defeats the whole who you are is good enough really message. does really does so we're at the festival they chose not to depict the festival in this animation nope they just told us that there was one and all we see is just crowds of people standing on nothing in front of nothing. Occasionally we see like a tent in the background, but mostly yep. it's just people standing or walking. Yep, that's, and, that's a festival. And the stepmother keeps telling the stepsister to smile. Stepsister says, if I smile any harder, my face will hurt. And the stepmother says, well, let it hurt then. <laughs> um, and then she goes, oh, the handsomest one is gonna look at you. And the stepsister tries to smile, and it's weird and giant. Very toothy. It's, a, it's an extremely toothy grin, almost horse-like, with the size that her teeth grow to. He doesn't notice her. He doesn't have a, a nausea response to her. He just, he just doesn't notice her. And the stepmother scolds, you're supposed to charm him, not scare him. Ugh. Let's try the not handsome but rich crowd, which... I would love if parties categorized themselves and the men just neatly organized into handsome, wealthy, but not handsome, neither wealthy nor handsome. I just think that would be a useful list that they could just self-organize. That would be appreciated. So Yishan is walking around just looking beautiful and she's not really looking at anything because there's nothing at this festival, but nope. everybody's kind of turning around to look at her. And some random guy goes, that's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Who is she? And someone else is like, oh, go find out. And nothing ever last, comes of that. Yep, that's the last we will see of them ever. And the stepmother sees her and goes, there's the prize winner. She'll get the handsomest, richest husband. She'll make her mother a very happy woman. Why can't you look like that? And the stepsister goes, because I was born to you. I loved it. That's my favorite moment my favorite moment so they then argue about whether she looks familiar or not with the stepsister insisting that she looks familiar and that she thinks she recognizes her and the stepmother going she looks familiar like a queen or a princess she's probably a member of the royal family and they note her slippers which are you know gold yes and they choose to bow to her as yan shen walks by the prince is now 
the handsomest it, one the handsomest one is now making an evil face he has just sort of the mean smile smirk and aggressive eyebrows that villains normally have and so i found him very confusing he's not evil he's it's also just... not the prince in the sense of like archetypes in the cinderella story yes sorry i, I suppose i should continue to refer to him as the handsomest one so the handsomest one walks up to her and asks where did you come from to which yeshin responds from a place so distant it's under your nose and the handsomest one says can i ask your name and yeshin responds it is the same as a long departed ancestor and the handsomest one says may i know the name of that honored ancestor to which yeshin responds you would have to ask her and then they all laugh and i was just waiting for are you called impertinence or do you honestly refuse to tell me your name <laughs> which I, I like that interaction. It makes no sense in this context, but I liked it. I think I've been on the record as being very annoyed when there's two guys that interact with her because it splits the limited amount of time she has to build a relationship with her prince. Agreed. It, it's like splitting the vote. You know, yeah. you can't, you can't run wins. interference like that. Yeah, don't do that. So yeah, I thought they did that again. I, I didn't understand why she danced at the festival with one guy and then ended up with a different guy. Which is not to say that that, that there's any... Oh my God. <laughs> which is not to say that there's anything wrong with that, like in general, but narratively, it's all over the place. Yeah, for the purpose of telling the story of Cinderella, it undercuts your story. So after the laughing finishes, the prince, the handsomest one, asks Yeshen, may I presume you are an unmarried person? Which, I thought that was a weird way of phrasing that. That's one of those lines that would make sense if this had been translated and just dubbed weirdly, but it but wasn't. It wasn't. So that was a weird question. Yeshen responds with, you may presume, but the day is young. Which, bold. I like that. You have to just really put into the universe the things that you want. You do? You do? Uh, the handsomest one asks, uh, says, you are the most beautiful creature on earth. If you were to dance with me, we might help the day age gracefully. But he says it in a really sultry sort of come on way. And I, it made me uncomfortable. See, I thought the way he said it was very smug and kind of like pompous so I interpreted it as let's let, let's give the little people something to look at that was also a very justifiable interpretation which I would accept the point is that I did not like the way he said it oh yes agreed so then they start to do the most bizarre dance ever well everybody else stands around just watching nobody else is dancing I'm fine with that. There is a thing where people just stand back and watch a single couple. Uh, I've experienced it. It is a glorious feeling. I am not going to pretend to be an expert on Chinese dance styles. But this was not Chinese dancing. It was not anything Eastern. It was a weird waltzy type of thing with occasional walking. And it was weird and I didn't like it, I felt like it broke the mood. What little mood there was, what little believability I had in this horrific caricature universe was shattered by this weird semi-waltz going on a stroll dance thing. I mean, by the time they walked in and everyone's just looking at each other, it felt so like meat market-like that I yeah. was just like out. It was like yeah it was very mercenary so the stepsister is complaining saying i bet she has nothing to do but take dance lessons and be waited on by servants and then says i hate to say this but doesn't she remind you of our Yeshen? to which the stepmother responds preposterous but i do see the resemblance let me take a closer look and they both mince off towards Yeshen. Yeshen and the handsomest one kind of dance their way outside of the sort of 
tent pavilion situation they were near. And they're just standing outside alone in the dark. And the handsomest one goes, now what? And Yeshin goes, close your eyes. And don't open them until I tell you. And he does, and he kind of leans forward like he's expecting a kiss. And then she just runs away. Yep. And the stepmother and stepsisters line up in front of him with the stepsister striking a pose. <laughs> and the stepmother goes, feast your eyes on this. And that's what he sees instead of Yishen. To which his appropriate immediate response is, where is she? And the stepmother goes, gone. Something is strange. Could you look after my precious unmarried daughter until I return? And then she also just books it out of this movie and leaves the stepsister near the prince to raise an eyebrow coquettishly at him and uh, jiggle it as though she has a facial tick. And he turns and stares hopelessly down the camera lens. (laughs) That doesn't seem like the best way to start a romantic relationship is just asking for somebody to look after your child. I mean, there are worse ways. You could have a shoe trying on competition for starters. Does Gishin fall down a cliff next? Is that what happens yes. next? Mm-hmm. Okay. I just have in my notes, Gishin falls down a cliff and I went, I must have written that down wrong. No, no. Okay. So Yeshan slips down a hill and loses her shoes and her clothes all change back, even though we weren't told at any point that they would. Yes. She finds one slipper, but the other one is just somewhere far away and she can't find it. And the stepmother is getting closer and she's got a limited amount of time. And she kind of asks the shoe, gold eyes, tell me, please, where's the other slipper? And nothing happens. And she goes, oh, now I've lost you. And she's caught by the stepmother but she hides the shoe and claims that she just wanted to see the festival from a distance and she basically manages to get away with it and is told you've seen enough go home now so in the original story the reason that this makes sense is that the bones have turned into the shoe and the fish told her that she could not lose anything because he would not be whole and therefore could not do any magic so that makes sense it does make sense we're not told that in this at all Mm -mm. at any time whatsoever but that is that's what happens in the story is she loses the shoe and so the bones are no longer a single unit so he can't perform any magic or talk to her or help her with anything until she gets the other shoe so we see a sequence of beautiful backgrounds and time passes and the shoe is found by this random guy in a yellow shirt And he's like, wow, a golden shoe. And he brings it to a merchant who goes, most splendid, most unusual, and buys it from him and is like, I'll buy it. It'll be a gift. And the guy's like, to a lady? And he goes, to a king. You missed a teeny bit of this conversation, which is my favorite part. He goes, this is amazing, incredible. Is there a mate? And the man goes, I searched the forest, but could not find one. And he goes, I'll buy it. (laughs) <laughs> why did you ask then my man what i if mean it's a solid gold shoe like who cares who cares <gasps> why is the yeah but do you have the left one though why is that are you presenting that as a selling point or like a like a, a point that is a point of contention when well, you're definitely gonna buy it anyways i don't know okay, that part like, was... to be fair most people do expect shoes to come in pairs most people don't expect shoes to come in golden platforms though so then we see the castle and there's a king in there. And I was very surprised to see a king because I thought the handsomest one was going to be the prince. And yep. now there's a king. So is the king going to be the prince? Who's the prince in this situation? Keep on watching to find out. Mm-hmm. I mean, listening. So the merchant comes in with a shoe and greets the king with, oh, wise for your years, king. I don't have the line like here's a shoe is what my notes say oh you're great and wise for your years highness i bring you most remarkable gift the likes of which have never been seen and it's a wooden box and there's a golden shoe inside i love the wise for your years moment because i think that's the best way of saying yeah you're kind of dumb though because the for your years sort of implies that 
anyways i don't know you know this guy's like a 20 year old and this oh, yeah. merchant guy is like i mean you're not completely stupid i guess uh, it, it was it was bizarre and so the king is very impressed by the shoe and asks who made it and the merchant responds that he doesn't know and the king says this shoe is so marvelous i'm convinced it was made for a lady of great beauty and wealth i must find this woman he just decided he's just decided Meanwhile, you can do see, that when you're a king. I suppose you can. Meanwhile, we see Yeshen searching the forest for the shoe, and she's not successful. And we see the king trying the shoe on various women. And then we see Yeshen the next day going through the marketplace. Through Asking the town. everybody yeah. about the golden slipper, if they know anything. And she basically has to retrace the steps. So she's told that a guy found it in the forest. She talks to him. He tells her he gave it to the merchant. The merchant says that he gave it to the king as a gift and that the king would never give it up because he's so entranced by it that he'd give anything to find a young woman whose foot fits in it and that all the females are flocking from all over the kingdom to try it on why don't you join them and she goes thank you i shall and then she gets in line yeah i there is a tiny point where she offers to buy the shoe from him and he just laughs in her face Largely because he's already given it away, but also because it's a giant golden shoe and she's dressed in, in rags. I also hated the, all the females are flocking. I was, I was like, oh, guys, don't, don't do that. You're really no, unnecessary. It's extremely unnecessary. You could just say all the young women or all the women. That would be fine. All the ladies. All the single ladies. ladies. All the single ladies. So the guards see her standing in line in her rags and they're like, should we throw her out? what should we do and the one goes no the sight of her trying on the slipper might amuse the king we have to talk about these guards just for a second we haven't stressed this recently again everybody is a horrific racial caricature but the guards are wearing armor that is closer in resemblance to an astronaut suit Mm -hmm. they have metal earpieces that look like ferengi earpieces from star trek they're clearly trying to do the uh, Mongol metal helmet headpiece metal sort of neck cloth thing, but they fail. They fail, and what they wind up with is Ferengi astronaut. It was it was so, a choice. It was a choice, and somebody really cared about that choice, and somebody was wrong. So then, to add to the confusion, the handsomest one shows up, yep. and now the king and the handsomest one. Or in the same room. And I didn't like that. That was very confusing for me. That was so confusing. Because I didn't know who I was rooting for yet. It turns out I was rooting for the king. But I didn't know that yet. I was rooting for the movie to end. (laughs) So he just shows up and he points at the shoe and goes, yes, that's the one. It belongs to the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And he doesn't have her name because she ran off before he could find out. But she captured his heart. And the king goes, I've only ever seen her slipper, but she captured my heart too. And then they kind of look at each other and bond over the fact that they're in love with the same woman, yeah. which was Is a weird it? beat, but I was into it. That's not normally how that goes, but I'll, I'll, that was fine. So the handsomest one announces that he saw her at the festival. And so they decide to go there to look for Yashen because they think that that's where she's going to be. Which is much better than trying the shoe on every single girl in the kingdom. Yes. Points for narrowing it down to an appropriate village. The king immediately then announces that the tryons are canceled. The women file out of the room in a sort of orderly fashion. But Yeshen hairpins back and races towards the shoe, but is caught by the guards. And she's saying that she has to return it to her friend, that he must have it. And the guards respond with, that shoe is far too small to fit any man. Are you telling it us your friend is a man? And she goes, my friend is a fish. And the guard guard responds appropriately. The guard says, your friend is a fish? Then your fish has a crazy friend, which is a very roundabout way of saying it, but yes. But yes. And then they throw her in the dungeon. And then they tell the king, a girl in rags tried to steal the slipper, said the slipper belonged to her fish. I had her thrown in the dungeon. And the king goes, hmm, the slipper design is very much like the scales of a fish. 
poor girl have her released in the morning in the morning <laughs> in the morning not now well he she did try to steal it i guess they think I, anyways so but the- i love how he was like hmm yes i see how she might have started thinking about fish so many choices in this so <laughs> so many choices so the king sets up a tent and he so she's says, released in the morning by the way she is with a very salty guard who basically just boots her out and they tell her to stay away from the golden slipper yeah so so that was completely pointless and served no purpose whatsoever meanwhile the king has set up a tent near the village and he says the shoe has been lost will the owner please step forward to which the entire village steps forward i don't know how he didn't see this coming i I think that's the wise for your years bit like (laughs) seriously man seriously this is what all right suppose you're royal so the stepmother and stepsister uh walk forward and the stepsister tries to try the shoe on the stepmother says she lost it on the way to her lute lesson it doesn't fit the stepmother says oh it's always been a a bit snug but the king says next and the stepmother goes "Mm, i'm next to which the king responds no you're not (laughs) which i love because the king hasn't seen her the king has not seen her at all all the king knows about this woman is that she owns this pair of shoes (laughs) He just decided. He just decided. Ah, bless this story. Just bless it. So the stepmother and stepsister are chased out by the guards. And Yeshen sees all of this from where she's hiding on like the reeds. Yep. In the bushes. In the bushes. Yep. Um, the king goes, I believe we might have frightened off the rightful owner by our presence. Let's leave the slipper here, hide nearby, and see what happens. And he says this, by the way. So the handsomest one, and I think they're BFFs now, and they're just gonna like lie in wait for this woman they're both in love with. Have they discussed what happens afterwards? No. Not they clearly have not. So they do that. Yeshen sneaks up and steals the shoe, and the guard goes, I'll throw her into the prison forever. And there's this bizarre running gag for a few minutes where the guard keeps saying, Look, she's stealing the shoe. Can I arrest her now? And the king goes, No. Maybe she's taking the shoe for her mistress. Let's follow her. And they follow her back to the cave. And the guard goes, she'll be surrounded. Now can I arrest her? Just, it keeps going. It was a bizarre choice as a running gag, but I I did enjoy it. I thought that was pretty funny. So she takes the shoe that she has from where she was keeping it in her bed. And now she's got both shoes. And she goes back out of the cave and down the ladder into the pond. But unfortunately, her stepmother is awake and sees this happen. So Yeshin goes to the pond and she puts the shoes together and she says, gold eyes, my friend, the precious golden slippers are together again. Now you can return to the pond of your forefathers. And the stepmother and stepsister walk in with sticks and they yep. yell at her and about stealing the king's slipper and being a little thief. And they discover that they're a matching pair and they decide that this is their ticket. This is their fortune is made. This is their ticket out of the cave. Mm-hmm. Yeshen says, please, the slippers must be together so that Golden Ice can go to the pond of her forefathers. She repeats this phrase a lot, and I'm delighted every time she says it. Here's the part where I got really confused and annoyed, sort of extra, an extra helping of confused and annoyed. The shoes are already together. The, the criteria, as stated, is that they must be together and they very clearly are and within the universe of this cartoon we don't even know that we don't we don't i know this just decided yeah uh, i know this because wikipedia exists in my universe but this movie i'm deeply baffled and i don't i don't like it when movies just go they'll just know like no you gotta tell me man you don't have to i don't know anything dump but you gotta please include me in your universe but just then the king and the handsome one step up and the king yells stop and the stepsister goes it's the handsomest one and the stepmother she goes, it's the king in the handsomest one oh god it's just this movie man all right 
And the stepmother immediately switches gear and goes, I've caught the thief, your highness. I will punish her for the rest of her life. And the king goes, who are you? Yeah. But he says it to Yeshen. Uh, the stepmother responds with the worst stepdaughter that a stepmother could be cursed with. And the king goes, what is your name? And Yeshen goes, it's Yeshen. And he's like, Yeshen, what are these slippers to you? Which is so insightful. Right. I love that. This is the first reasonable thing that anybody has done. It, it just shows like genuine curiosity into her motivations and like who she is as a person. Yep. I love it. I liked it too. She responds to this with, they're my friend, my poor dead fish gold eyes. <laughs> and he just calmly goes, please explain. Yes. Again, I like the king. His motivations confuse me, but all of his actual interactions with people are uh, fairly upright and honorable, and I, I like them. So Yeshin basically just recaps the entire story to the king, and partway through, after explaining about the magic fish, the stepmother goes, she clearly has to be put away. And Yeshin ends with, again, and I have to have the shoes so that he can go to the pond of his forefathers. And the king goes, okay, fine, basically, but try them on first. So she does, and suddenly she's encased in a gold amoeba. There's, there's no other way to describe this. It is a sparkly gold amoeba that is amoeba-shaped. It's not smoke. It's an amoeba. And the handsomest one points to her, and trapped inside a giant golden glowing amoeba, and says, that's the one I danced with. And then smoke rises out of the, I cannot emphasize this enough, amoeba. And it is the ghost of her fish friend. And he thanks her and says, goodbye, your dreams are about to come true. And he fades. To I thought the stepmother yells, he was a good eating fish. I'll say that for him. What was that? Why was that line there? They just keep reminding us of the fact they... that they ate the sentient fish. Yep. That's so wrong. That's so wrong. Uh, oh, yeah, no. The stepmother continues to speak, telling Yeshen to take off the shoes and those garments. I am your guardian. They belong to me now. And the king goes, no, Yeshen is a free person. Your friend, the mystical fish, has brought me into your life for a reason. I would be honored if you would be my queen. You that man Yeshen's. can read the writing on the wall. I, I guess um, you got to do Yeshen's answer here because I wrote it down, but I'm pretty sure I got it wrong. She goes, if I'm destined to be your queen, then I am happy beyond belief. I will do everything to fulfill your trust and love. So that's, that's a weird way. That's a weird thing that is not said. That's a weird, sure, I guess, I suppose, maybe. Nowhere in there is an affirmative it starts with an if, y'all. It's not an affirmative statement. I, I think it's because she doesn't quite believe it. She's saying, it would make me so happy to be your queen. I, I, sure, I guess we'll give it that charity. So the king kneels before her and takes her hand and then stands up and raises his free hand into the air, striking a very heroic pose. And then we cut to just a distance and... We can't see them, but it's pretty clear that Yeshen and the king are in this fancy box that's going to be carried. And the stepmother goes, isn't it wonderful? I certainly brought her up right. And then waves and sort of hollers at the receding sedan chair. We'll come visit you at the palace, Yeshen, my dear. And then the movie ends and immediately we get our narrator again, this old white guy in live a, action live action live not a action. cartoon anymore suddenly this old white guy in a suit on a cartoon set that says and i quote so yeshen and the king live happily ever after but the wicked stepmother and stepsister were caught in a cave-in and never heard from again and if you like yeshen the library of congress thinks you'd like these other books and i lost my mind how do you just not finish a cartoon and have the narrator just finish it for you. He's finish not even the narrator. He's like the announcer guy. I don't know. I don't know. So I had to go look this up again. And there are two alternate endings, which we're done with the movie now. So 
yes the movie has finished i would like to finish the story in a more appropriate way there are two alternate endings one is that the stepmother forces the stepsister to basically take over the be my slave now duties Mm -hmm. which the stepsister refuses and they fight so hard that they cause a cave-in i like that better in another version the stepmother and stepsister are buried in a shrine called the tomb of regretful women (laughs) they then become goddesses in later tradition and have the power to grant anyone's wish i'm just reading directly from wikipedia here guys after Yeshen's marriage with the king, her husband became greedy and abused the fishbone's powers until it stopped yielding any magic soon after. The queen Yeshen thus buried the fishbones in a nearby beach with a great quantity of gold. A year later, the king's people led a revolt, and in order to appease them, the king tried to dig the fishbones and distribute the gold to the rebelling soldiers, but the gold was washed away by the tide along with the magical bones, and the fate of the king and Yeshen after the siege remains unknown that's wild right wow yeah and then so this is the thing where i told you that it got worse even though it was done now so i was trying to find information about this and what i found was a prompt for school children in a book called the power of extreme writing Uh. and it talks about this and it offers some writing prompts it tells a real quick Uh, review of the story that is inaccurate talks about diagrams and uh, you know offers useful things such as uh, ask your students to write a a pedestrian sentence such as this is a comparison of the classic European Cinderella with the Yeshen and then have them write something more interesting oh god but but then it gets so bad because then she offers forth three quote extreme writing topics in relationship to Cinderella, one of which is, one, stories of times that I really wanted something, two, stories of the best outfits or costumes I have ever owned, and three, stories of going to a party. No part of it is overcoming hardship or the power of kindness or being kind and having it come back and benefit you later. That's not the way it continues to get worse. Uh, she then uh, wants them to talk about wearing parts of animals as clothing and says that there are three motives for wearing clothing protection, modesty, and decoration. And then she talks about various things. I'm just going to read this to you. You can cut this whole thing because I was just so mad about this. The next huh, section is called Mutilating the Body. Another mini research project topic could be the custom that involves altering the body to create, quote, beauty, such as the custom of foot binding in China. Customs such as foot binding actually distort the body to an extent, to such an extent that it can even be crippling. It's 100% crippling and it can be deadly. It, people died because you get infected. Anyways, a discussion with students about potentially not making any changes to their body that cannot be reversed would be fruitful, particularly that fashion should be worn, dot, 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 not be part of your body dot 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 because what's in fashion now will be ridiculous when you're older in parentheses imagine full body tattoos on someone who's 80 and wrinkled for example at which point i had to remember that this is my only computer and i cannot just yeet it across the room and then she's terrible and then she offers 10 things of body distortion things that are this is under the body mutilation category Tattoos, nose rings, gauges, extending the ears, tiny feet, elongated necks, some African tribes where if the rings are removed, the person suffocates, teeth blackening, cranial binding, very common in the Incan people, facial scarring, uh, teeth sharpening, and lip plates. All of those things are very culturally important to the cultures where they're relevant. Those things have um, historic meaning and cultural meaning and sometimes religious meaning. The tattoos and scarification are rites of passage and they're extremely important. Also, tattoos are for the person who gets them, not for the person who views them. Also, age is beautiful. 
The other option is death. So age is lovely. I hate everything about this. This is the worst. And to make me even angrier, they then include a picture of a bound foot. So I hate everything now. So what were your highs and lows? I reject the premise. No, okay, I, I don't reject the premise. I think my high was the, uh, why can't you look like that? Because I was born to you. <laughs> I, I like that it's the only time we've ever seen a stepsister stand up to her mother mm -hmm. in an actual Cinderella. The Cinderella's two and three of the Disney one don't count. So I like that. I like it when stepsisters stand up to their abusive mother. I thought that was a fun moment. My low, I don't even know how to pick. I think the scene where she catches the fish and we get this freeze frame of this fish with a horrified fish expression on its face wrapped up in Yeshen's red coat about to be killed and eaten. Either oh. that or the step family's recitation of it kept crying out your name. That was also the whole fish thing. That was deeply was upsetting. Deeply. I mean, I, I could... I could rank my lows from lowest to also extremely low, but that was definitely the one that I'm going to be upset about the longest. How about you? What, what are your highs and lows? Okay, I really liked that the king was so open to seeing what was going on with Yashen. Agreed. He was like, let's not arrest her. Let's see where she's going. Maybe she's doing something. When he sees her put the shoes by the pond and she's like, trying to say something he wants to know what she needs what she wants to do what mm -hmm. these shoes mean to her mm -hmm. and when she tells him the story which sounds bananas he goes okay what a nice young man agreed agreed i agree with you on all of those points he did approve her being in the dungeon overnight he, he can't win everything Colin. yeah i think my least favorite part is the fact that it's unfinished that they cut off without finishing the last 30 seconds of the cartoon and just summarize them for us yeah no you know what that's not even it the thing that i hate the worst is the style of animation which is gross and racist and how beautiful the original book looked did mm -hmm. you look at the original illustrations i did not take a second to google it let me google it real quick what is beautiful oh my gosh Oh my god. No, that's, now I'm extra salty. That's what I'm being graced about because Agreed. that's what they based it on or off. Ugh. So also in the original story, the father just has two wives. And she's the daughter of one wife and the stepsister is the daughter of the other and the wife dies in childbirth and the father dies in like a plague. Which I prefer to her being an orphan. Just like they took her in out of the goodness of their hearts or something she's she's genuinely part of their family so mm -hmm. anyways no i would agree with you then i hadn't looked at the uh, original um drawings and that's genuinely extremely beautiful um, mm -hmm. i'm mad too now continue to be mad so if you could change one thing about this movie what would you change um i wish that it wasn't super racist Agreed. I wish that it was like a better depiction of the story because it's a really interesting story. It is. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change the fish thing because that is traditional to this part of the story. That's how the story goes. The thing, the part of even she meets the handsomest one and then she winds up with the king who is not the handsomest one is part of the original story. The, the king sets up essentially a shoe trying on stand and is very intrigued because she tries to steal it and then marries her. So it, the, the story itself is bizarre from what I'm used to. And I love it. I love that it's different. I was really excited about this. So I think what I would have changed was my expectations going into it. In reality, yeah, I would change, I would change the, the voice acting. I think that if it had been voice acted, with more cultural respect, mm -hmm. it would have been 
much better because if it had been drawn better but still voiced the same it wouldn't have mattered no you're right yeah so I think I would have changed the voice acting the backgrounds were genuinely lovely yes now, they were I, I I just I wanted it to stay on just panning background establishing shots the entire time all right so um will you ever watch this again no yeah no me neither I, re- I resent having to watch it twice uh, I can't I, believe we watched it twice well it's only because they packed in too much crazy for us to be able to take notes I'm so mad that time. we watched it twice me too I I am also mad about this um I'm just going to go ahead and answer for both of us. Listeners, don't watch this. Um, Don't do it. There are some other beautiful Chinese Cinderella's, which we're going to review later, which are actually made in China. And so they will at least not have a horrific Western filter over them. And they look fabulous. And I am excited about those. But um, don't don't watch this. Read the book. Definitely check out the picture book. The illustrations are gorgeous. The story is very interesting and beautiful. Yeah read the wikipedia article it's also fascinating it's a good story this is this is what we came to the cinderella podcast wanting to do was to find different versions of cinderella the really terrible article that i read also announced that this is the first cinderella and that all cinderellas are based off this and that is not true the oldest cinderella is several thousand years older than this and comes from greece but the same stories arise in different places because this is one of those sort of universal stories that it's very archetypical it's it's one of the five archetypical fairy tales the history of fairy tales is fascinating to me but this is a a constant among society the rags to riches love story something about a dress and a party or a shoe yeah listeners don't watch this uh we got to do a final grade for this movie what what are you giving this movie can i go with d minus okay just left a bad taste in my mouth just didn't like it yeah i again i'm torn because this was a cinderella this was the first asian cinderella that we've seen it had some things that i liked about it but also i hated it hated it uh yeah i think i have to give this an f because i just i was just drowning in racism just the whole time it was so bad and the the high points were so low yeah there's just so, nothing there so far between so while i liked various parts of it and while i appreciated the the differentness of the story and i'm really looking forward to watching other adaptations of this genuinely from my heart i'm looking forward to that uh i hate this i regret putting it on the schedule I regret watching it. I regret everything. <laughs> so. Well, it's almost midnight. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. If you liked this episode, please leave us a rating or a review. We'd love to hear from you. So follow us at CinderPod on Twitter and Instagram, like our Facebook page, or email us at the Cinderella Podcast at gmail.com. If you want bibbity bobbity bonus episodes or to hear us discuss this week's Cinderella again, but with more adult beverages in the Ever After Party, please support us at patreon.com slash cinderpod. Our intro music is Bad Ideas by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. So, love, what are we doing next? I'm so excited about this. So, coming up next, here at the Cinderpod headquarters, we'll be hosting our first ever Cinder Emmys. On this special wrap-up episode, we will discuss the entire season as a whole, our findings in general on this strange and sometimes terrible cinderella verse we're going to do in-depth analysis and we'll have brand new questions the like of which are only available to our patrons and we'll be hosting a brand new adventure it will take us some time to finalize our lineup so we will be back here in one month for the ultimate first season performance results and if like me you don't remember a single cinderella previous to the one you've currently watched (laughs) um this will remind all of us what we've been doing this whole season yep it's gonna be great we're really excited it's gonna be some really fun discussion material guys so please join us okay we 
we're gonna go now we're gonna go to the after party which if you were a patron you could come to bye so until next month we hope you have a happily ever after